By 1930, most all the secrets were known about how to make engines run really well, produce horsepower. Well, the Duesenberg brothers and Harry Miller pretty much figured all that out in the 1920s with all of their race cars. The question for a car company was only, how do we make money with this? Well, some companies like Cadillac, Packard, Auburn, Lincoln, they went for the cylinder wars. They wanted more cylinders. Whereas Duesenberg had a dual overhead cam ordered by E.L. Cord. Now, they didn't want to build the engine that E.L. Cord ordered. They really wanted something that was lighter weight, more efficient, put out more horsepower. But that's not what E.L. Cord wanted. He wanted this big, massive engine, and they wanted to paint it bright green. Well, the Stutz Motor Car Company uh, by 1932 was really kind of hurting. Harry Stutz was <clears throat> long gone, and uh, a fellow by the name of Charles Schwab owned the company, and he brought in a fellow by the name of Moskowitz to come in and kind of revamp the, can the company and try to give it a kickstart to try and save it. Well, one of the ideas was, and they didn't have any money, take an SV16 block, an earlier Stutz, and put a dual overhead cam head on it kind of oversimplification but that's basically what they did they were going to go in a direct competition with a Duesenberg don't know whether that was very smart or not but were they successful so our 1932 DV32 Stutz here is reported from the factory to put out 156 horsepower at 3900 rpm well let's see if we did any better Well, let's see how we did here. You can sweep up and you can sweep down. We kind of like to sweep up. It more simulates driving up a hill. When you get to the top of the hill, then you let off of it. So that's essentially what we're doing is the dyno has a big 10 horsepower uh, electric motor that is pumping water and it's pumping water through the brake rotors and that will create a resistance to the engine. So what we do is we load it down when you saw it going down in the sweep, and then we start capturing the data under 1500 RPM, and then we slowly let the dyno go, and that's what's going up the hill. So you can do it up or down. It just makes more sense for me to go up. So here's our engine. This is a 322 cubic inch engine, whereas the Duesenberg, remember, 420. So this engine, a whole lot less uh, cubic inches, but more compression and really does very well uh, compared to the dual overhead cam Model J Duesenberg. So this page is the initial page that you see. It gives you all of your peak readings. You know, like on this pull, it was 165. We did the tuning. We got up to 181. Things settled out. And then the more we ran it, the more it goes, keeps going up. And it'll top out. And it topped out about 185 horsepower. So it'll tell you about where your peak RPM and torque and all that is. I'm sorry, what your peak torque is and what RPM. I made a mistake on this one. It's a 3900 uh, RPM engine, and I forgot to capture data past 3200. It's a setting on the computer that I just totally screwed up on. And so we stopped recording at 3200, but it doesn't really matter. Our peak is, is right in here at 2900 to 3000 RPM. It's all downhill from there anyways. So this will give you your averages. 
This uh, dyno has a weather station on it so that it can compensate for altitude, temperature, humidity, and all that. And it usually runs at about 130 to 136 uh, percent. We're at 6,400 feet here. So then this will give you a performance spreadsheet. Corrected torque, corrected horsepower. That is because of the weather station doing a correction factor to kind of put us back to sea level with a standard day, 70 degrees, and I think it's 50% humidity, something like that. So this is pretty typical of these torque figures that we see in Packard 12s and, and some of these kind of cars that put out 175 horsepower. Auburn 12 will do the same. Your supercharged cord V8s will do the same as this. They start out pretty high in the 320s to 340s. Look at this. Uh, we started out. It's getting better and better as you're breaking it in. And so down here, you can see this line here is your corrected uh, torque. And then these lines are your corrected horsepower. And of course, we can only measure torque. We can't measure horsepower. Horsepower is a calculated term. So you'll see four poles on here. Our first two poles we pulled out. And so we just don't, we just kept, we just quit collecting data. And I'll explain why in a minute. So this will give you a fuel table. And what we like this for is, is it kind of gives us an idea of how the engine's running. But really, we have another meter on here that tells us our hydrocarbons and, and CO2s and all that. And that's what we really tune the carburetor to. Because these numbers are like all over the place. When you when you look at a, a fuel flow or even mass fuel flow, which is a calculated term, it's all over the place on these values. You know, you had 18 here at 1800 RPM, and then all the way down here, oh, I lost my mouse, 17 at the end. It's all different on every pole. And it's like this on every old car engine. And I think it's because of carburation. We spend 80% of our time on carburetors, maybe 90% on carburetors. It's a big problem. And I think part of the reason is, is that they're very inefficient. Today, we've got all these things in our fuel from oxygenators, MTBE, uh, ethanol, and all these things that these old carburetors just don't like to process very efficiently. Plus, we're running a lot higher octane fuel. It was about 45 when these cars were new. We're running 87 today at the lowest level. And we'll even put 100 low lead in these things, and, and that's probably even worse. Uh, cleaner, but, but worse as far as we don't like the high octane because it's a hotter burn. So 90% of our time is trying to get our, our carburetor settled in. And it's reflected in all of these crazy numbers on these fuel flows. But the data is certainly nice, nice to have. Um, there's a lot of stuff here, exhaust gas temperature spreadsheets. We don't really worry about them because we only got one exhaust. It doesn't really matter much. Uh, but we do pay attention to this, our oil uh, pressure, our oil temperatures. Water, we can put whatever temperature we want because we have a cooling tower. This is a little on the cold side. We like about 170 to 185 degree um, water temperatures. And these are running a little bit cold in the 140s, 150s, 160s. Um, so the guys just weren't monitoring it quite as close as maybe they should have. What's really important here is we had really high oil pressures when we started out. And unfortunately, this car did not have good ownership to it. And normally what happens is when you got low oil pressure, they think, oh, well, let's increase the spring in the, um, in the pressure regulator and we'll get more oil. Uh, false. Doesn't work that way. Oil pressure comes from a good oil pump and good bearing clearances, etc. cetera. Um, so all they end up doing is, is increasing the top end when they increase the tension in the spring. So we got that all settled out here. We got real good numbers at 1,500 RPM. And we're at 42 pounds at idle at 650 RPM. We don't collect that data. It's only from 1,500 up. And see, I made a mistake here at 3,200. I should have gone clearing up to 3,900, like you saw in the video. Uh, but anyways, we got really good oil pressure. We like this. You don't want too much oil pressure. I hear people say, well, you can never have too much oil pressure. Yes, you can. What ends up happening is the oil is squirting onto things in the engine that it shouldn't be. Instead of an oil uh, squirter shooting at the cylinder wall right in the right spot, it, it may miss it. It may get it in the wrong spot. And so no proper oil pressures that the manufacturer puts out is really important. So are your oil temperatures. This one's running really good. 
250 is a red line, 220 is a, is a yellow line. Um, but look at these oil temperatures. They're, they're just running really nice and cool. Uh, the engine really cools or uh, cools very well and it also oils very well. It's a very good system uh, for, for oil uh, and getting the oil to where it needs to be and all the special little things in the camshaft. We'll do a video on that system sometime on the way that they oiled in the camshaft. So it was really pretty cool. So you're probably wondering, why did he quit at six poles? Well, the first two poles, we got it tuned to the point where it was running pretty decent. The next one was better. And then we settled in 180, 185 horsepower. Bounce is a little higher than that. But it has to stay at that horsepower for over a second for the computer to, to log it. So the basic reason is, is we were scared to keep going. And the reason why is... That's a very expensive engine. It's running like it should. It's 30 horsepower, more than what the engine was designed for. Why take the risk? The most likely thing that's gonna happen to this car is they're gonna go get ice cream in it. They're not gonna race it. They're not gonna be a hill climber or anything like that. Why risk so many tens of thousands of dollars in blowing the thing up? It's running like it should, call it a day. And just like that, it's in the chassis. So dyno one day, it's hanging on the hook the next day, in the chassis, transmission hooked up, getting ready to do the drive shaft and some of the other things. In two days, the body will be going on this. So there's no grass growing underneath our feet. 